Thank you, everybody. My name is Jonathan Gray. Um, appreciate you all joining me today. I'm going to be talking about Cask, a company that I founded, and uh, what we call unified integration, which is a new kind of concept that we, we've been starting to talk about, not necessarily something that other people were talking about. Um, but it's something that we really stumbled across over the past five years. Cask has been around for five years. We've been in the market trying to sell in the Hadoop space. And we've learned a lot. And what I'll talk about is a little bit of past, present, and future. Um, why we started the company, the problems that we see in the ecosystem, in the market, uh, the kind of path that our product has been on. I'll actually talk about the, the different kind of evolutions and, and phases of our product. And then where we are today and what that means for the future. And then um, that should only take about half the time. And the rest of the time, I'll, I'll use for a demo and any kind of Q&A and stuff like that. So big data, Hadoop. We really think about it um, today in these three major phases or waves of how enterprises are adopting Hadoop and big data technologies. The first has been the rise of what we call enterprise data lakes. Um, this is really, number one, about low-cost storage. Number two, offloading from expensive data warehouses and tools like that. And number three, starting to look at some new types of data science, some new types of data sets, things like that. But ultimately, a dumping ground for your data, not necessarily something that is directly deriving business value. But it's an enabler for these big data analytics, which is people want to generate that 360-degree customer view. They want real-time dashboards that bring together disparate data sources from all over the place. They want to be looking at time series data sources. They want to look at web logs and new types of unstructured data or semi-structured data that previously they were not keeping inside of their data warehouses for analytics. And more and more what we see in this phase is, is data science and the introduction of machine learning and things like that. But this is still really BI and where we think the market needs to go, where our company is really, really focused and where we see enterprises and all kinds of companies really delivering the most value from data is when analytics turn into applications, is when the loop is closed. And so it's not just delivering me a daily report about my customers and what I know about them or I don't know about them. It's building a recommendation engine and actually actively targeting them while they're on the site. It's not figuring out who's likely to churn. It's automatically offering a customer recommendation, an upsell opportunity, some kind of discount to a customer who's likely to churn. As you go into the world of IoT, we're seeing more and more, I don't want to just take my IoT data and aggregate it and do analytics. I want to actually cr create control loops. I want to actually drive decision making. Some of that could be rules-based, but some of that could be machine learning based. Maybe I want to look at my network. I want to get an uh, anomaly detection algorithm to determine when something is amiss and then take a further look. So as you go down this adoption path, business value goes up, but so does technical complexity. And as a company, CAS is really, really focused around this entire kind of adoption life cycle. And how do we enable large enterprises to really get to where we see the most value, where we see really disruptive business value coming from big data around these production data applications. And that's really what we're going to talk about, is the challenges with this and, and how our platform addresses that. So it comes as no surprise. Getting value from big data is hard. Number one, it's the sheer complexity of it. Big data really means kind of open source, distributed systems, scale out, unstructured, semi-structured data. These things are all inherently complex, right? The sheer number and the sheer scope and size of what the Hadoop community, what the big data community and ecosystem means, just means that you have a lot of different services, projects, APIs, and systems that you need to become familiar with. And it's a constantly evolving landscape, so you can't just master something and two years later expect that to be the same thing everybody's talking about. Every two years, it's a complete new cycle of technologies. All of a sudden, everyone's doing Spark streaming on Kafka. Two years ago, literally no one was talking about Spark streaming on Kafka. So there are very few people. And so the fast-moving nature of this ecosystem creates a lot of complexity, not just for the developers, but the enterprises. What we're seeing now more and more is this divergence of the different tech stacks. So whereas Cloudera and Hortonworks, for example, used to be fairly similar, um, now we're seeing a lot of purposeful differentiation. Different SQL engines, different management tools. 
different governance, different security. All of a sudden, all of these different things are very, very different depending on the different Hadoop distributions. And then if you look at the cloud, you're getting a whole other set of stuff. And so that, that bottom uh, infrastructure landscape is now becoming very, very differentiated, which is creating some divergence in the ecosystem, creates complexities for everybody else. And lastly, there's this rise of kind of new integration silos. Whereas the story of Hadoop has been about all these different technologies that you need to integrate together, what we've seen recently is there's a lot of different point solutions, tools and scripts and processes to take data from A to B or to run this type of query on this type of data. But that doesn't make a platform, right? You end up with this kind of tool-based approach that all of a sudden I have yet another integration problem where I have to integrate all the different point tools and point solutions that I've used. And so basically, big data, Hadoop, this is a market completely oriented around infrastructure and integration rather than the applications and, and analytics that are trying to be derived on top of it. So the whole market and all the people involved with it, the whole focus is kind of flipped on its head. And if you compound this with the fact that all these different constituents need to interact with Hadoop and big data initiatives, obviously the developers, the operations teams who are going to run these things, but more and more it's the data scientists and line of business and product teams who are the real consumers, the real stakeholders, the real people who actually have demands and, and needs from big data. And without a platform here, without a set of tools, without something that IT can actually own and run against all of these different stakeholders, it's really, really hard for them to be an effective enabler. And it leads to a lot of kind of ad hoc, one-off projects, a lot of chaos, not a lot of centralization, not a lot of platform. And so Cask was started about five years ago um, by myself and my co-founder Nitin to really address these challenges of the open source big data ecosystem, to try to create an open source platform that accelerated what people needed to do on top of the stack by doing a lot of the stuff that everyone has to do over and over and over again, but do it as part of a platform. Um, I came out of Facebook, my co-founder came out of Yahoo as early kind of Hadoop and HBase engineers at those companies. Um, so over the five years, uh, we've raised 37 million for some great uh, venture capitalists and some strategic investors. Um, 3.6 is the latest release of the platform, and we'll obviously talk more about what that platform is, and we'll demo it. We work with some great large customers and partners, work very closely with the Hadoop distributions like Cloudera and Hortonworks and MapR, the cloud providers like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, um, and some great customers like AT&T and Salesforce. We recently released CDAP4 Preview. Um, I'm also going to demo this if we have enough time, um, which introduced the Cast Market, which is like our big data app store. And when we go through the demo, you'll understand more and more what that's all about. And why Cask? Well, Cask uses a container architecture. Cask is a container to abstract complicated concepts in a simple way. Simple access to powerful technology or putting big data on top. So how did we arrive at this notion of unified integration? When I started the company with Nitin, we really, really thought about um, our first platform as WebLogic for Hadoop, or JBoss, or Tomcat for NoSQL, right? What application servers did in the Java world, or even .NET and other languages like that, that have these runtime environments, they really, really accelerated how fast developers could build their apps and get those apps into production. And so we really started out doing that for Hadoop, for Yarn, for HBase, for MapReduce. We built different data abstractions, pre-built a bunch of integrations, we unified metrics and logs collections, we created this really cool unit testing and debugging environment, this local development environment. But what we found out was in the enterprise, unlike at the internet companies, there's this thing called data integration. There's this thing called data governance and security. It turns out at Facebook, they don't have those things, right? There's no security, there's no governance, it's just a free-for-all, basically. And so working closely with some of our customers, our early customers, and really responding to what we found out in the market was, look, I can have my production application running, but if I can't get production data to it, the app is of no value. And so we really broadened the kind of capabilities of the platform to really embrace data integration and kind of this notion that applications and data in the world of big data are kind of one and the same. To take an example, if I'm thinking about building a recommendation engine from a bank, right, and I want to upsell people when they log into my mobile app. If somebody's either very likely to churn, I want to give them a, a discount, 
or if someone's just a really active, engaged customer, I want to upsell them to another service, right? Now that sounds very appy. It's some microservice recommendation API my dev team needs to build and enable for my mobile team. But actually, it starts out as data ingestion and an entire data integration project. I need to get my CRM data. I need to get my web log data. Now I need to load that all into Hadoop. I'm not ready to develop on it now. Now I need data scientists to figure out when are they likely to churn, right? When is somebody a good candidate to be upsold to something else? Then they figure out what the right features are. They figure out the right models to build, the right algorithms to use. And then things are basically rebuilt in production by development teams. That whole process, right, to eventually get to some production you know, microservice that gives your mobile app an upsell is like an 18-month project, right? And it's no wonder because these open source technologies all give you the raw capabilities, but that entire system, especially if it needs security and governance and compliance, is just a really, really big project. And so a platform that brings together data and applications so that those pipelines I use to ingest already integrate with my data science tools, allow my developers to build applications on it. Really, this all being a single platform is the powerful concept we kind of stumbled across working with our, our early customers. And so the next version, we added all these ingest capabilities, these workflow and pipeline capabilities, metadata, and all that kind of stuff. Really expanding to say the modern middleware looks like a fusion between application and data middleware. It's not two totally separate categories anymore. These things have really come together. And then the final current kind of incarnation of the platform expands beyond the kind of apps and data to what we call unified integration. And this brings together two new kind of components to it, and I'll, I'll dive more into those. But basically, security and governance, really, really important concept, um, especially in enterprise environments. And then maybe most importantly for us has been self-service, which is to say this platform can't just be accessible to developers and operations teams. Big data needs to be accessible to non-developers, starting with the data scientists, but going all the way into citizen integrators and Excel and SQL jockeys and people like that. Today, state of the art in most data lake initiatives is those people are filing a ticket to IT, and IT is doing manual work to get them their data. We need to flip that whole thing on its head and enable way more self-service by non-technical users. So CDAP, the CAST data app platform, that's our platform. And this is the first unified integration platform for big data. So this brings together the whole notion of application development and management with data integration and data governance. The whole platform is open source. 100% Apache license open source, and really built for extensibility. This is really adopted by our large customers and turned into their platforms, from anything from how you skin it and put your own logos onto it, um, to how you modify it, change it, extend it, enhance it. It supports all the different uh, major Hadoop distributions and clouds. So everything in CDAP is portable. So anything that you write will run in about eight different versions of Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapPar on-prem. And also, we'll run on EMR, HD Insights, um, and Google Data Proc. We also integrate with the latest and greatest in open source, like Spark, Spark Streaming, and Kafka. Um, soon, we'll be adding Flink support and, and more and more of those projects uh, as they become popular. So unified integration is really these four concepts. And I'll dive into kind of each one to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So the distributed application framework, modern data integration, security and governance, and self-service. So CDAP, we call a modern data integration platform. Well, what does that mean? It means you can ingest any kind of data from any kind of source. You can very easily explore that for analytics and data science. Whether I want to do a SQL query, an R script, a Python script, a Py, Spark, Scala, Spark, whatever kind of thing I want to be able to run on that data once ingested, I should be able to do that very, very easily. Now I want to actually process it in a scheduled way for doing ETL, machine learning pipelines, things like that. And eventually I want to serve that data back up. Could be a REST API for a microservice. I could be putting it back into a data warehouse. I could be publishing it up to, to Kinesis or S3 in the cloud. CDAP supports all these things. And it does so both in real time and batch, reliably and scalably, and in very sim simple and self-service ways. 
And so doing it ingest and egress and ad hoc analytics and data processing pipelines are all not just possible in seed up the platform, but possible through higher level UIs, um, very, very simple uh, self-service capabilities. Distributed application framework. This is really where CDAP started. Really around enabling developers to very quickly build their applications. We have a local environment. We have a whole unit testing. We have uh, IDE integrations, a whole bunch of different capabilities and tools to really help developers move very quickly to really make that fast developer iteration loop. The faster the loop is, the faster people are going to develop. So part of that is our test and CI framework. We make it so that any of your applications, they could have HBase tables and Spark streaming jobs and all that stuff can be very easily unit tested and CI tested. You're able to deploy those into any application, any of those applications into any of the different environments like I talked about, cloud, on-prem, and very easily scale both the applications and data that are part of your applications. Again, this is real-time and batch. Um, CDAP has three major runtime modes. We call memory, local, and distributed. Distributed is what runs on a Hadoop cluster. Local runs on your laptop. That's what I'm going to demo. And memory is a fully in-memory version. And basically, what local and in-memory do is local is for development and local testing and things like that. It gives me a single process. So I can attach my debugger. I can look at all the logs in one place. A really simple user experience. And then the in-memory version is for doing unit testing and continuous integration testing. On top of this data integration and application management framework, CDAP layers a kind of standardized security and governance layer. So CDAP automatically captures all the metadata about your data, anything that comes with it, and then anything that happens within the cluster. All the data ingested into CDAP and processed within CDAP is always locatable. So there's easy data discovery, search capabilities, things like that, um, lineage capabilities. So you can always find all your data. Every access, every job, and every query is audited, and lineage graphs are generated. So you can look at the provenance of any of your data in the cluster, um, understand how it's evolved, how it's moved, where it came from. And finally, what we call usage analytics. We actually look at what are the popular data sets, what have not been accessed for three months, things like that. So that you can have more of an idea of when you're looking at your data, um, what's being used, what's not being used. And then some core capabilities like encryption, authentication, and authorization. You basically need these things to have security. And so CDAP provides um, all these things against everything that happens within CDAP. Finally, the self-service user experience. This is raising everything up into the UI, raising everything out of the IDE, um, out of the hands of, of strictly developers. And these come in the form of two specific tools, products. The first is called Cask Hydrator, and I'll demo this. Hydrator is a code-free framework to build and run data pipelines. Everything you do in Hydrator, once you publish it, just becomes an application on the platform. But this is a code-free way of generating these applications. So I want to write a Spark streaming application that pulls from Kafka and writes into HBase. Well, I can write that in code, or I can develop that pipeline inside of Hydrator. And we'll show some examples. So it's a full drag and drop GUI. You can create, debug, deploy, and manage the pipelines from the UI. It separates logic, the logical pipeline, from the physical execution. So I build my DAG however I want. I can choose whether I want it to be run in Spark or MapReduce. And then when I hit go, the system generates an actual physical workflow for it. So I could have 100 different nodes in here. It could end up just being one map side MapReduce job, or one very simple Spark job, or it could be 10, depending on the nature of the uh, pipeline. But everything you run in Hydrator, everything you build in Hydrator is native to Hadoop and Spark. So Hydrator is really just a UI and a tool that generates Spark and MapReduce based workflows. And so everything runs on Spark and MapReduce. Um, so it completely scales and performs with those systems. Tracker is the complement to Hydrator. And it's basically the data discovery and metadata exploration. So all the data sets that you use in CDAP, anything that you do with Hydrator, automatically searchable and discoverable within Tracker, as well as the lineage graphs and things like that. Tracker supports what we call external data sets. So if I'm pulling from an S3 bucket or a Teradata database into Hadoop, Tracker also tracks that Teradata database or that S3 bucket. right? So it includes it in its lineage graphs so that you have provenance outside of the Hadoop cluster. 
So Tracker supports rich application level metadata. You can add your own metadata through Tracker or you can use all the REST APIs in CDAP. Automatically tracks lineage and audits, provides this data usage analytics, and it also integrates with MDM um, systems, right? So a lot of what CDAP does is duplicative of a lot of other things. So for example, CDAP provides full dashboarding and metrics and logs inside of the UI. Do we expect people to use this as their de facto production log and metric systems? Not really, no. But when I'm on my laptop in development, it's very handy to just have that there and not be dependent on an external system. And then the same goes for this type of stuff. People have a lot of MDM solutions, a lot of data discovery solutions, all that kind of stuff. This is serving as something for everything under CDAP and one dimension out. But all of the data that CDAP collects, everything from the logs, the metrics, all the audit events and these lineage graphs, the metadata events, all that is pushed onto Kafka queues and can be then pushed and published into other MDM systems. So it includes integration with Cloudera Navigator. So all this data automatically will be populated to Navigator. Um, but it can be integrated with literally any MDM system. So we kind of act as a bridge to all the new open source stuff inside of your Hadoop data lake back into your existing enterprise and the tools, MDM systems, discovery tools you're using there. So how does CDAP actually do this? Basically, this is our container architecture. It's all oriented around these notions of data sets, programs, and applications. So all your data, regardless of the format, regardless of the data storage engine, any of that stuff, the schema, whatever, we call a data set. We manage as a data set. We track metadata. We do security. We do the auditing against the data set concepts. Same in the programs. Whether it's a MapReduce job, a Spark job, a Spark streaming job, a web service, um, we have something called a worker or our workflows. All of those are represented as a program. So when I package it, when I deploy it, when I start and stop it, when I get the logs and metrics from it, when I apply role-based access control to it, when I get my audit and lineage graphs from all of this stuff, it's all done in the data set and program level. And so it's totally agnostic to the specific infrastructure system, to the specific runtime, to the specific database, file formats, and things like that. And it's through this kind of standardization that we really, really help large organizations when they're adopting Hadoop, especially when they go from MapReduce to also having Spark, or they're going from being all on-prem to also going in the cloud, or they have multiple Hadoop distributions, all that kind of stuff. Um, this really, really, really helps. And it really helps to kind of provide a single integration point for all the open source big data stuff you want to do versus each time there's a new project or something, you have to reintegrate that with your in infrastructure. When you get into the world of governance and security, this is when it gets really, really important. Um, most governance tools and most security tools for the Hadoop space were very, very MapReduce built or Hive focused and don't do anything for Spark yet. And the exact same thing is going to happen when the next Spark thing comes. And as soon as it goes from everything being HDFS to the world moving to S3 or moving to something else, you're going to have this constant problem with the existing tool sets because they're very, very focused on the technologies that they support. And CDAP takes a different architectural approach. This is our container approach that allows us to be really flexible with the types of data sets, the types of programs and all that, and to create a totally agnostic integration plane for your operations team, your security team, and your governance teams. So CDAP is really focused across this whole application lifecycle, from the development standpoint to the whole production operations and governance standpoint. And so much time gets spent on the right side of this. Um, and I think that's often why our customers are often more sophisticated in the market. Um, oftentimes, people who are still early on in their, in their adventures with Hadoop haven't gone through production operations and governance, haven't shipped multiple projects to understand that there's not a lot of reusability in between projects. Most things are one-off. And you spend way more time on making things operationalized than you did doing the initial code. Oftentimes, the initial prototypes can be very fast, but moving these things into production can take a really long time. And so CDAP is that single framework to both build and run these data applications and data lakes using Hadoop and Spark. And our core value is really around saving you time. We save 80% of time, 80% lines of code. This is something that's been borne out multiple times with almost all of our customers and prospects. 
um, where they've done different comparisons before and after. We've had competitions within the same company, one person using our platform, the other one not. All kinds of different situations. Usually it's about a 5x acceleration. Seriously, seriously significant acceleration in time to market, time to insights. And more and more importantly, as the world's becoming more diverse in infrastructure, as things are beginning to move more hybrid and cloud, really removing barriers to innovation and future proofing what you're doing so that you're not completely designing your platform into a corner and fixing yourself to specific technologies, specific Hadoop distributions, specific environments, and things like that. Really creating way more flexibility and putting the focus on the applications, on the analytics, on the logic, and not so much on the infrastructure and integration. So a few quick customer success stories. These are kind of anonymous, but all very real. The first was a health insurance company. Um, not a lot of Hadoop expertise, but Hadoop customers using Hadoop distribution technologies, but pretty much just off the shelf Hadoop distros, not using other tools. Really were just frustrated with how slow it was. They didn't have a very sophisticated development team, and so it was taking them weeks and months to basically do anything. Really, really just stalled on progress. And so this was very much a hydrator and tracker oriented uh, customer. Two days, we did a POC, and they had their first sets of pipelines in production in the first two months. And so after about two years of not being in production, within two months of engaging with CAS, they were in production. A much bigger company, a big SaaS platform, less about hydrator and tracker, less about pipelines, more about applications. These guys wanted to take a new, real-time, massive-scale product to market. Really small team, but a lot of technical hurdles, basically, to get through, technical challenges. Enormous scale and really strict requirements. Part of the, the, the um, requirements of this application was actually to go back and call the customer. And so because they were going to call the customer, um, it had to be exactly right. They could never miss it a single time. And so because of all these technical challenges, it was an infrastructure project, not an application project. Right? The product team was not spending any time building the product. They were building everything around how do I do reliable, high throughput ingestion. Right? CASC provides, CDAP provides a whole bunch of capabilities for ingestion, real-time processing, things like that for building these types of apps. And so they adopted those um, capabilities. And one month in development and three months in production, that's all the same overlapped, actually. So within three months of beginning to be engaged, we were in production with the first customer, serving live traffic to an actual uh, user-facing service. Yet another larger company, a uh, large telco. This is on the other side of the spectrum. Some people are very app-oriented, especially SaaS companies. Very large enterprises like a telco, much more focused on the data lake side. How do I build a data platform that's going to allow me to scale enterprise-wide? Not how do I build this application and this team for this use case? So this was a really fun environment. Multiple Hadoop distributions, multiple technology choices, multiple architectures, multiple security protocols adopted, just a whole bunch of different things across a very large global organization. But what they wanted was a centralized data lake. They wanted a data lake which had security, governance, policy built in. So when somebody requested data and they got access to it from their group in their division, whoever they were, it had already been complied with all the policies necessary for that person to access that data. Right? And to me, that is the dream of the data lake. That's what everyone's really going after. So this company uses CDAP for their de facto kind of data lake management and orchestration layer. Everything from how do you do the ingestion pipelines and things like that to ETL, um, workflow, um, and egress. Like I was talking about with existing MDM system, existing data discovery systems, it's not that we displaced the decades and decades of MDM and other types of data systems that had been at these large enterprises. That's not a good strategy. But fitting into those and integrating with them and helping to bridge them into the new world of open source and cloud is where we found a good position and kind of where CDAP sits well. And today, this is many, many hundreds of users, many, many thousands of pipelines, many petabytes of data. We got some cool awards this year. Um, we were certified a great place to work. 
We're based in the Bay Area. We're hiring. So we're in Palo Alto. Um, Gartner also named us a cool vendor. Um, Lotomy, one of our great early customers. CDAB was a big win for us. They were one of the first to kind of validate the 5x thing, um, saving 80% of your code, 80% of your time. Um, all right, we got some other uh, analysts and stuff in there. So we'll get into the demo quick, but before that, I want to kind of tease what's the latest and greatest in the product. So we actually, this was originally part of the vision five years ago when we started the company. It's in my first pitch deck. I can prove it to you. So even though, right, when we started out, we never saw ourselves as a data integration company. We saw ourselves as an application company. We're still an applications company. We're just a data application company. And I think what we didn't realize was what the product was going to look like, but we knew roughly what the, we wanted the product to be. And we wanted to enable the App Store. We wanted to figure out how can we be the platform for ISVs to build applications on large amounts of data. CDAP4 is a preview, which is starting to hint at kind of how we're positioning the company that way and where the product's going. So the big thing here is our cast market which basically allows you to take anything like one of those apps or a pre-built data set or any of these things and publish them into an app store. And so now I don't have to be in my IDE writing code. I don't even have to drag and drop. I can just click a pre-built pipeline, fill out any remaining information via a wizard, and hit go. So further simplifying the user experience. We're also adding a Wrangler. Um, this will be pretty basic in the first version, but basically one of the uh, most requested features in the platform. We've completely rebuilt the CDAP UI based on React. Part of the reason this is really relevant is our customers have customized our UIs. Our customers take our UIs and pack them up into their own UIs and all that stuff. Um, everything in CDAP is REST-based, and so it's very easy to add UIs on top. And we make it very easy to bind REST APIs to everything you're doing in your applications on Hadoop. And so custom UIs is, is very common for our customers. And we're just making it really easy to use all the UIs that we have into your own. If you're not familiar with React, basically it makes it very easy to create components, reusable components, and, and swap them in and out in different places. And then finally, the resource center, which is wizards for common tasks. If I want to take a file and load it into HDFS and run a Hive query against it and it's CSV, I don't want to drag and drop a box. I just want to hit next on a wizard. You tell me exactly what I want to know. That's what the resource center is all about. So we talked a little bit about this, but basically, we want to have a time to value in minutes without existing experience. I'll do a demo of Hydrator, and you'll see it's not a complicated tool to use, but it's still a tool. So still have to be trained to use it. And so the market is about putting more and more and more pre-built stuff so that it is very, very obvious, and it's just step-by-step -step instructions, not something that you have to be trained how to do. Today, this is all open source. It's all sitting in GitHub somewhere. Um, but we have plans to add third parties in here. We're already in a lot of talks with different partners, both ISVs as well as SIs, on basically building more and more things to make available through the CAS market. Um, one of the other things we're adding is the ability for people to run their own CAS market. So pretty much the first thing that happened once we put out the preview was our biggest customers all said, yeah, we just want that internally. We have all these resources, all these new things that we keep building around the platform. This is a way for us to publish it and make it kind of accessible within the organization. So, all right, we don't have to go into this. Let's, let's get into the demo. So while I'm starting to demo, are there any questions to keep us going while we're demoing? Yeah. Yeah, it's HL7 data, and it's for this HEDIS reporting stuff. You guys have to protect it and encrypt it, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. One of the, yeah, I mean, we support encryption. We support authentication, authorization, all that kind of stuff. A lot of it has been this HL7 format, which is a complicated healthcare format that needs to be parsed and scrubbed and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, we're working really a lot with healthcare companies today. We do work with financial services. You know, it's been, I think, we, we would expect more, honestly. Healthcare and telco are probably our two biggest verticals, and SaaS, the third one. 
Um, you know, I think one of the reasons financial services hasn't been, been as big yet, and they're really coming around a lot more now, um, but this is a platform. In our big cells with big enterprises, we're usually calling someone else's baby ugly. They've, they've built elements of CDAP inside, right? Anyone here who's working at a large company or someone who's adopted Hadoop and NoSQL for a number of years, elements of this for sure are inside of your own bespoke stack. And so at financial services, they kind of started the earliest and have built the most. And so there was the most political stuff to deal with at those companies. So we focused a little bit less on them, quite honestly. But when you go to healthcare, they don't think they're technology companies. It's a lot easier to sell them a platform that's focused on simplifying their lives and accelerating their paths. And they don't have a non-invented here kind of issue. But we have some, some really good financial services wins. And I think it's going to be a good next 12 months for us in that space. Um, as the politics are loosening up across the big banks and stuff like that. So what I have here is CDAP 3.6. This is the latest kind of GA release and what we call standalone. So standalone just runs on your laptop. So it's empty, nothing in it, no data sets, no applications. Um, so I'm going to start with a really simple one. And I'll kind of make this up as we go. Let me zoom this in so we can get some more real estate. I think uh, like 15 minutes. All right. You see this OK? Close enough? So I'm going to start with a simple example. I have a, yeah. Oops. OK, access log.txt. And it's got what? Nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine lines. Okay, so I'm going to create with Hydrator a pipeline that takes this file from my hard drive. Normally, I would do it from S3, but I don't want to rely on the internet here. And we're going to do a Spark pipeline that writes us into um, some Parquet files. And maybe we'll do an aggregation on it. So we'll, it's a web log. So we'll do some kind of like counting by status code or something. So we'll see how many non 200s we have in our web logs. So we'll call this our web log import. We're going to read from a file. So Hydra has two different modes batch, batch and real time. Real time is in Spark streaming, batch is either Spark or MapReduce. And that, you choose that as configuration. I'll show you that in a sec. So we're going to load the file. I'm going to do a log parse on it because it's a com log format. I'm going to do a little JavaScript, inline JavaScript function. And then I'm going to do a group by. So here is my file. So this is my local file sitting on my hard drive. Just this one right here. Actually, I'll show you guys a cool trick. I will create a dynamic file here, a dynamic name. So I can put configuration file, configuration values inside of my, my configs here, which are runtime generated. So file can either be in the environment, or when I start the program, I give it file. I better name that name. Seems like file might be reserved. So this will be our local file. When I give it this reference name, this gives it a um, data set name inside of Tracker. So when I want the lineage for the, for example, the Parquet files that are generated, this is the name of that source. All right. So we're going to parse it. You get offset and body from a file. Offset is just the line number. So it's CLF on top of body. And this is the output schema. In the JavaScript transform, I have to do something really stupid that I found out when I was. I'm going to move status to code. 
And you can ask me afterwards if you're interested in why I had to do that. Um, and yeah, that's all we need to do here. And then let's write this out. So I'm going to write this to, we can do it to different kind of NoSQL databases. We can do it to any JDBC database, ODBC database, HBase, Hive, whatever. Or we can do it to CDAP managed data sets. So that can be like a uh, TPFS parquet. That's a time partition file set parquet. So all I need to do here is give it a name. So we'll call this web logs parquet. It'll automatically give the schema and everything like that. Group by, let's group by the status code. And we're going to count, count. Oops. So I just configure the group by, I tell it to generate what my output schema would be. I'll get per code counts out of my group by. And then let's write that down to a H base table. And its schema will be there. And code will be the uh, row field. All right. Now we can modify some more settings here. We can set a schedule, either a basic one or just an advanced arbitrary cron. We can set resources against it. And we can also set the runtime, either MapReduce or Spark. This also supports post run actions. So if I want to send an email or hit a REST API or something like that when the, when the uh, job completes. Or I can also take things like SSHs and, and HDFS uh, commands, things like that, and make those custom actions without the, with, uh, throughout the pipeline. Now, behind the scenes, what did I keep doing? This is actually just generated a JSON structure. So even though you've built everything visually, you're really just generating a JSON, and so you can check this in. Um, you can parameterize the file. So just like I'd put that parameter in there, it's something that you do really commonly doing stuff through JSON. Um, and so you can export this, import it, export it, give it to somebody else. They can import it on their cluster, things like that. But I will publish this, which is taking that JSON, publishing it into a CDAP endpoint, and generating a new application. So when I hit start now, it's prompting me. It's already telling me that I have this file name I need to give. So I will give it. And so you can actually parameterize anything. You can parameterize output table names. You can parameterize the inputs, all that stuff. And so you can create deployed pipelines that are all parameterized with runtime params. So you have a single pipeline for doing all different types of things. So this is running now. If we want to, we're in Hydrator now. If we want, we can peel back the, uh, the onion a bit. And we can view it in CDAP. And when we do that, we can see what it's actually implemented as. So in this case, it's a single workflow with a single Spark job inside of it. And then it generated two different data sets, weblog counts and weblogs parquet. One, inter one interesting thing I'll show you, the job is running right now. It's writing right now. But one thing CDAP does is it provides basically transactions and ACID semantics everywhere. And so things are never visible until they're completed. So if I run this SQL query, there's not going to be any data in there, even though there is data there. And if you actually um, circumvented everything about CDAP completely, would be able to see data there. But CDAP essentially is providing atomicity to the workflow operations, the data set operations, and all these things, um, which, when it comes to applications, creates a lot uh, of simplicity. So let's wait for this thing to run. Looks like it's about to finish, hopefully. Doing this big group I probably, sitting in memory on top of my laptop. There we go. There we go. So let's look at the data now. So we can look at the raw parquet. 
and we can see that we have parse sub logs sitting there. So when I deployed that pipeline, it actually created HDFS directory. It created uh, hcatalog hive metastore entry. It did the entire SERDI configuration, mapping it to there. And every time this pipeline runs, it generates a new um, partition. It registers that partition in Hive for you. And so all of that integration work between HDFS, the Parquet file format, and Hive Metastore, you don't even touch as the user. When I hit publish, all that stuff happened for me. I'm running in unsecured mode because I'm running on my laptop, but in secured mode, it would be carrying all my credentials, right? I would be the user that created those resources, and anything like that would have just inherited from me. And then I could go in and modify the, the access control. We could look at the uh, web log counts, see what we got. Mostly 200s, a couple 404s, 304s, but makes sense. Looks like legitimate data to me. So in the next five minutes, I want to really quickly All right, while we're waiting for that, we have five minutes left. Any more questions? Yeah. Now, if you had a custom data format and you wanted to write a custom uh, parser for it, I'm guessing it's possible, but would it, uh, you would write it somewhere and then you would be able to use it in uh, this? Yeah. In so all of those different things you saw on the left panel in Hydrator are all written against a Java API. The, by far the simplest one is the transform API, basically event in, event out. And the, the major thing what Hydrator does is it provides basically schema and typing, right? So all of your inputs and outputs are we call structured records, look like Avro. So you basically get a structured record in, you write arbitrary Java code, and you emit structured records. You build that into an actual application in CDAP, and you deploy it into the, the platform. So I'll show you in one sec. Unfortunately, I just took it away, but um, you basically, so Hydrator uses what are called plugins. And a plugin is a transform or a source or a sync or what we call analytics, which are arbitrary spark jobs or actions, right? And you write against those APIs. Any implementation of those APIs, you can generate as many as you want. You basically register them with CDAP and they're automatically published and made available to everybody. And so people have a lot of customization that they do. Um, a lot of their own transformations, things like that. One of the things almost everybody will do inside of people who adopt Hydrator is you can turn any of the, um, you can turn any of the uh, sources and stuff. Like let's say I have database here. I can create a template from it, which basically pre-populates stuff. So I could give username, password, JDBC plugin information, and lock it, and basically call it, you know, our local MySQL dev cluster. And it's already pre-populated with all the different configuration parameters and things like that. Um, and we also support an uh, encrypted key store. So I can basically encrypt my credentials to my databases, store them inside of an encrypted store, and reference them by variables. But the last thing I just wanted to show here in our final seconds um, was the new CAS market. So this is also available for download. You can get 3.6 for the GA stuff, 4.0 for the new stuff. Um, but basically, part of what this does is it allows you to package things into use cases. So I might have a spam classifier machine learning. This allows me to ingest a bunch of labeled messages, ingest a bunch of unlabeled messages, deploy a spam classifier trainer against the train messages, and then run, run the spam label, labeler against the unlabeled messages. So you can create like these entire complex use cases inside of the market, and it's just step, 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 walk, through, walk the user through it. Or you can create like sample data packs, so like that access log. I click this button. This is actually gonna use the internet. You get the idea. So you can link to sample data sets, you can link to existing um, pipelines, plugins, things like that. And this is also a way to, um, let's say you create your own transformation functions and stuff. This is why a lot of our customers want their own cast market. 
some team may build up new plugins and new things like that and basically want to publish them, make them available so other people can find them. And they're going to do that through this market. Today we're using this for a lot of like JDBC drivers, right? So you can have step-by-step -step instructions for doing MySQL because we can't package the drivers. But we can give you, you know, here's three steps, insert the file here and go for common stuff like that. So with that, my time is up. Um, Cask has a booth here if you guys are interested in learning more. Um, otherwise, cask.co, and you can download CDAP, give it a try. It's open source. Let me know. Thank you. <laughs>